All right. Three sides of the coin this week. Lots of minutia around the creatures era. This week, three sides of the coin. It's my life. Is that really the KISS demo we're hearing? That question has been raised this week by somebody who was involved with that demo. It's true. You're going to have to tune in to, uh, to find out. And Marco's out. fanboy. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. The last one. But this is the well. first this is this is the first one you're watching in the new year. It's the last one we're recording in the old year. So so welcome to year nine. Hold on. Do we shoot them now or wait till we get home? Shoot them now. Shoot them now. <laughs> either way, you gotta, you gotta be over 40 to know that. Joe. Either way, another year under the three sides of the coin belt. Can't yeah. believe we did it again. And belt's getting a little wider. Let's face it. <laughs> getting a little, we're getting a little looser on our kiss topics as the yeah. as the years go on here, aren't we? <laughs> we've been pretty consistent, though. We, we do really pretty have. good. We do. Yeah, we've been good. consistently inconsistent. That makes us consistent. We haven't so. changed from year one as how crappy we are. True. That's true. <laughs> just, go, just go read the set pool. Yeah, exactly. Although, although I, I had to fucking crack up because my my buddy Bob sent me. Um. Because last week I, here's the crazy thing about Kiss fans. So last week I mentioned that, you know, and I mean this from my heart as a Kiss fan. Um, I'm guessing within the first three months, at least, at least two new Kiss things should be. And guys, don't hold me to this because I don't fucking control it. But I, I'm guessing within the first couple of months, some of this stuff should start seeing the light of day. It's really cool stuff. You're going to dig it. But anyways, so my buddy Bob calls me last night. He's like, here's a thread on the fucking cesspool about you and stuff you said. And I'm like, and then there's people like poo-pooing all over. And I'm like, look, guys, I'm just telling you, as somebody who's lucky and fortunate enough to help with this stuff, they're doing some cool stuff right now. I would think people I would think people would go fuck yeah that's awesome cool next thing you know oh my god everyone's arguing there, 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 there's all there's always a couple that are like well those guys are idiots and I don't like them and I don't listen to them and it's like okay good, great we get it but the, I love the I love the one that well maybe it was the first post that started the whole thing where it's like yeah and and Mike mentioned something about magic does that does that mean that maybe ross's book is going to be an official kiss book oh, and i'm just God. like guys it's just well, us digging it, hey guess what another christmas has come and gone and there's no magic book let's just put it that way well there's a, I, I, there's a couple of things i want to touch on here because none of us go there none of us pay attention i don't the only reason i know that is because someone has to tell me hey so it's funny so this morning fucking eight o'clock in the morning i'm I look at it and I'm like, well, not only are they talking about something I said, Tommy, your pictures or something was another thread. And I'm there, like, yeah, there's another thread about you, Tommy, and how, how terrible of a photographer you are. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, boy, these guys <laughs> never watch us and hate us, but <laughs> there's two fucking threads up. A, 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 apparent, apparently, you are not a professional photographer, Tommy, according to some unknown anom anonymous poster on, <laughs> on a message board. I'm not. I know. I'm just like, when has Tommy ever said he was a professional photographer? It's a fun hobby that he loves to do. It's just like when go, how come you can't ask better questions? Or why do you interrupt people? I'm like, well, because I'm not a fucking journalist. I'm some dopey fan who fucking cares. Shut up. As as as, as I always say when people give me comments like I'm that like that, I always say, Well, can you show me where I can listen to or watch your show so I can see how it's done? Oh, mm -hmm. you have never done it. Got it. So for those of you who think Tommy's photos suck, show us your concert photography so we can see how it should be done. Oh, you've never done anything other than using your iPhone? It's crazy. But I appreciate, you know, Kiss being kind enough to share some of my photos and 
you know, Gene telling me that the fire breathing shot from Minneapolis is the best one he's ever seen. Well, yeah, you're you're so shitty that Kiss used you in their new tour book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how shitty Tom gets. Well, you know, they put, they put the word for the tour book. You don't remember, Mark. They put the word out for the worst photographers out there. We I'm want like, your photos. I'm in. <laughs> yes. Hey, you know, hey, uh, you know, just just keeping on the, on the cesspool thing. Here's the funny part that just I, again the irony of it is when they start ripping on us and stuff. I'm like, dear, this is just to the cesspool people. I'm this is like a podcast for for one. Now. You do realize, like all of us, but uh, I'm friend good friends with julian you know he's a good guy i just Julian's helped him a great with, guy. that's what i mean i just helped him with a with a non-kiss thing and we've done other things in the past together and stuff uh, i get christmas cards from him he gets christmas cards from me he's a great guy we're friends guys he he laughs he laughs at the stupidity of the cesspool with me when we talk about it you, you guys i i i'm like well these guys are all dicks their podcast sucks we're we're cesspool fat. like guys we're friends. All of us are friends. There's no, there's no us against them. You know, I've said this before years ago. I, I met Lonnie once at a, at a, at a kiss expo. You, you wouldn't find a better fucking person. Lonnie's What's a that guy? Nice hey, we, guy. we, Lonnie was auditioning to take your, he was one of the, yeah, well, was, I, that's what I'm getting finals. at. I'm like, guys, Lonnie and Julian and, you know, some of the guests they have sometimes they're friends of ours. We don't dislike each other. We, I don't, I'm making fun of the crazy people on the cesspool who, like, the minute you say you're working on a kiss thing, next thing you find the worst thing to say about it and try and tear it down. I'm like, why, why are you even a fan? Why are you on a kiss fucking board? What are you, what are you contributing? Again, I didn't say that to go, geez, God, please let, let them mention me on the cesspool. I just was just talking, going, hey, other kiss fans on our own show. Hey, you know, I'm working on some stuff. I can't tell you what it is, but I think you're really going to like it. Take it. The cesspool finds a negative in that. I mean, a, a few of them did. I'm like, what the fuck? Where did I set you up for negative comments? I said, if you're a Kiss fan, you're going to like the stuff coming out. That's all. That's all. <laughs> and guess what? It's still coming out as far as I know. And I, I think you guys put it this way. Anybody who likes Kiss, I think is going to like it. And You'll probably go out and buy it. So, yeah, again, you know, I'm just consider I'm I'm blessed that I get to participate. And, you know, someone bothers to ask me about it. So I'm happy about that. It doesn't, doesn't make me cool or good or better. I, I, I'm just some dopey fan. Who cares? Exactly. I'm just trying to tell you. Everybody's saying, oh, I wish they put something out. <laughs> and I'm just telling you they're going to. Same with the photos. I, I do it because I love it. And and you know, and, and listen, I, I want I want to give Tommy a little pat on the back here. He just found some amazing photos from the Asylum tour in St. Paul, Minnesota. That the quality of these are incredible. People, he shot See, them front argue, row. We he, were talking about that. This I would argue because they're not. But they are. They, they are. I mean, everybody who's <laughs> seen them so far, Tommy, is just like, holy crap, these are great photos. And and I, uh, as of this recording, I had only posted four of them to my Facebook as a teaser because we're going to share one a day on yeah. the Three Sides socials. People were just like floored at how good these asylum photos were. And, and I'm telling you the same thing. I mean, it's like you shot him from the front row obviously you didn't have a professional camera i don't know what no. you had you probably had a i had a it was a eight. 35 millimeter camera that i borrowed from my brother-in-law yeah you know I mean, he, he I, I i seriously i literally got like six or seven rolls of film and he's like here take this it was a nikon and he's like do this and do this and do this i had no idea they and that turned out they turned out amazing so just you know if if you like vintage it's hard to think that the asylum tour is vintage but if you like vintage classic live photos that have never been seen before yeah these have never been seen they're front row they're beautiful colors for the most part they're all in focus it's not what you would expect from a kid with an instamatic camera smuggled into a a, a, 
a show. So well, back in those days, you could just take them in. No one, no one even looked twice at you. You know, they just right. didn't. And I just wanted to capture the moment because the first time I did it was the Dynasty tour. Well, and then you, I did you, it. You did an awesome job. So thank you. So we're going to share those with you guys. We're, we're going to share them. So follow Three Sides on socials, and we'll share all these asylum photos. And Tommy's digging through some old. He's got photos from other vintage tours that he's going to share with us as well. I even took so. a couple pictures of Wasp from that show. Oh, I'd like to see those. Yeah, only two, but you know, Me two's too. Good. That was the did, last command tour. Right? Did, well, because did, you don't. Because I was like, I remember going, God, I want to take pictures. But then I also thought, well, I want to keep my film for Kiss. For Kiss. So it's like, well, that, that's that, right. Because that was before digital where you could take 8 million photos. Yeah, I right. literally took like seven rolls with me. Probably all I had the money for at the time, you know, 24 or 12 exposures and just would keep shooting. So, like, now with the digital camera, you can, there's so many things you can do to, it's so different, but like you, I, I know the pacing of the show because I've seen it so many times. So like when Gene's getting ready to breathe fire, every time I see the show, I buy a ticket in a different spot in the arena because I want to shoot them from different and angles. angles. And, and, and they're kind enough to allow me to do that. And uh, with Gene, I don't, I didn't remember that I took the asylum shot and that was actually probably the best one of the bunch just because that's the hardest thing to get the fireball i was, I was going to tell you i mean i you know when i was working for kiss i photographed many shows it yeah. is very very difficult to get the timing right to get a fireball in yeah. perfect spot focused everything else so and get that, the depth of the fire that's well that that you got you top. that this asylum you got full body Mm -hmm. full fireball and you got you could see all of the the sprinkles of of the kerosene or whatever it is mm -hmm. coming off it was just like you captured it all and you know i i just keep going well this was in 1986 it's not like mm -hmm. you'd been shooting a lot of live concerts you that was the third concert i shot because i shot dynasty i shot creatures and then I shot Asylum. I don't know why I didn't do Lick It Up. I think it's because my tickets weren't as good. I was like in the 10th row for Lick It Up. And nothing I, I for Animal Eyes? Why. Nothing for Animal Eyes? Oh, that's right. No, I don't think I did Animal Eyes either. I'm not sure why. I can't remember. Or I did and I've lost the negatives. That's you know, it, what's funny is I was I went to the Animal Eyes tour and I had third row center and I took photos I can't, I don't know where my freaking negatives are of those photos because I took a boatload. Now, again, it was just with an Instamatic camera, but, but still, you know, when you're that close, you got to be pretty shitty not to have good photos turn out when you're that close to the stage. Right. Cause you get right. the good, you get good lighting. Everything's clear. You're right up there, but um, yeah, I mean, I can't wait to see all these other photos. Hey, by the way, for the creatures, any photos of the plasmatics? I doubt it. No, because I think for the for Dynasty and for because again, when you're a kid, you don't think about it. I'm so excited about going to the Kiss show and buying a bunch of Kiss stuff and right. seeing Kiss that I I think for for the Dynasty show as well as the Creatures tour, I maybe only took one roll of film with me. You know, I just wasn't thinking about it. You, it's just like, oh, hey, I think it'd be cool to take some pictures to remember the show. And right. then by the time Asylum came around, I remember deliberately thinking, look, I'm going to take as much money as I can. I'm going to buy as many rolls of film as I can. And I'm going to shoot as much as I can. Well, it's funny. I For the Dynasty show, I, 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 I didn't know it was small, whatever. I had an Instamatic. And I was about 15 rows back. And I took a couple because I was big because Cheap Trick opened. So I took, took a couple right. pictures trick but they look like a 14 year old kid with a instrument didn't know that you needed a flat you know what i mean i didn't know i just was like hey cool there's rick nielsen all i remember Back is i got a picture day, of him yeah. little Back in the day you just don't think about it well you don't know anything i mean i i, I remember it's like yeah you know that 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 kid who's sitting in the back balcony he's got the flash on because it's dark in the arena and i'm like well we didn't know that the flash in the back of the arena 
isn't going to light up the front of the stage. It's going to light up six feet in right. front of you. So you're going to yes. get a great photo of the back of the head in front of you. <laughs> you know, and that's a really good point that you make by bringing that up. If you guys are going to a show and you're trying to take pictures with your phone, turn your freaking light off because two things happen. Number one, the battery dies really fast when you're using your flash. That's number one. And number two, um, you also have a situation where you um, end up in where you uh, just it blows everything out. It, you don't it, get it, wa it washes everything out immediately in front of you and you don't see anything on the stage. Right. Right. Well, here, I just I'm sending you guys. Here's a here's a dynasty shot. She looked great. Like <clears throat> Let's see, where is it? Where is it? I did one roll of black and white and one roll of color. Because I probably bought the black and white thinking <laughs> it was color. You know? <laughs> Like I said, when you're a kid, you just don't think. I, about I, I know. I mean, when you're a kid, it it doesn't. None of this means anything to you. You're just excited to be at the show, and you're going to take some pictures to remember it by. That's what blew me away about these asylum photos was how damn good they were. Realizing you were just basically a kid taking some photos of a show you wanted to remember. Well, yeah, I was. That's I was expecting. Awesome. I was expecting Instamatic photos. I'm like, okay, well, Tommy took some pictures when he was, you know, whatever, 20 years old. Okay. And I'm like, holy fuck, these are great. You know, I know. That's, <laughs> that's exactly what I, I was thinking because I was the guy taking the Instamatic camera in there. <laughs> he well, just kind of think everything. Well, and here's the funniest thing about the whole thing is that I love taking photos now and I, I found a different, a passion that. I still, at the time, I take these photos of the concert, and then that'd be it. I'd be, I wouldn't even think about doing it again. Like here, I'll turn one around. This here's here's so here's a shot from the Dynasty tour in Minneapolis. Wow! Wow! That's like a poster, yeah. dude. Yeah, it, it just and it was just dumb luck. I wish I could find my pictures. I took it. Look like it looks like a fucking three year old. <laughs> I know. You you probably got half your thumb in front of the lens. You were moving, or somebody bumped into you, so it's blurry, and you missed the action altogether. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I did that. <laughs> oh, most of the time. Tommy's like, oh, here's one of my bad shots. It looks like fucking, you know, something out of an well, no, movie. Here's one of the best. Here's one of the best. <laughs> Image reverse them, but it's awesome. Yeah, dude, what are you doing? Those, Those are great. great. You got a great lot of color them. too. Great color. A yeah, a lot of them aren't though. But you know, thanks to Kyle because he did he did a lot of restoration on these pictures too, which was really nice of him. To hey, take we got to get a little voice box thing because you know you gave me the bell every time I mentioned that I did something. I want a Cartman going Kyle every time that you say his name. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, have have you have you thought about releasing a photo book? No, I never thought about oh, it. Jeez, here it comes out of left field, Zingo! <laughs> I bet you could get it out by next Christmas. Tommy, has I anyone reached good. out to you for your photo shit? And are they delaying a book because you're doing it? <laughs> Newly <laughs> discovered <laughs> photos <laughs> that now have to go into a book. It's going to be magic, man, magic. Hold on, you're some. Oh, oh. No, I was honestly embarrassed of the asylum pictures and the other stuff that I took. So I hadn't looked at it in 30 years. You can't be embarrassed. These are fantastic photos, man. Right. Thank you. You guys are being very nice. No, no because I'm being honest. Like, I'm looking at what I've created over the last five years. And I know that it's an impossibility, but it's just like, well, man. Yeah. I mean, the, these asylum photos aren't like what you've shot on the end of the road tour. But you've got to sit here and go, it was 1986, and you basically just brought in your own little camera, and you were dealing with the crowd from the front row. Again, oh, yeah. anybody who's ever snuck a camera into a show, you know what the end result is going to be 99% of the time. Crap. That only Garbage you will appreciate yeah. because you were there. These that are photos. 
Well, and I can remember crazy nights because Gene would be like, he'd come up to me and he'd be like, you know, I'd just be like, just keep taking them. Right, whatever, you know, you're not going to throw me out, you know? I mean, but, you, you, uh, you, you, you've got this great um, asylum photo. It must have been, I'm assuming, like at, at, at the end when the, the, the band is out doing their bows where Bruce is doing this to you. Oh, yeah. I've got one like that of Eric Carr from uh, Crazy Nights something like that that stuff is fantastic anyway yeah. you gotta follow you gotta follow us on on all of our socials we're gonna be sharing a bunch of these these great photos from these photos have never been seen anywhere nope 40 nope. years yeah it's been a long time so yeah i mean hats off you guys are gonna love this um there's nothing else we oh i want to not a plug but i just want to show this okay this is bruce kulik recently sold this it's a mini guitar but it's one of his crazy nights guitars beautiful it looks beautiful oh, i saw um, that that's cool yeah i bought you know he did one last year of of his yellow guitar um they're just great, great. I mean, and I love, you know, being able to do a little bit here to support Bruce and, and, and buy some of his stuff. Anytime Bruce, keep an eye out. If Bruce comes out with more guitars, Bruce, if you're watching or you get word of this, do more, more guitars. I want to see more, right. more mini well, guitars. If you guys aren't following him on Facebook, you should, because he and his lovely wife, Lisa, do impromptu songs all the time, you know? Uh, whether it be home for the holidays or a kiss song, Bruce is really active on social media. So if you're not aware of it, get on Facebook and follow him because he's always yep. doing really cool stuff. And then he's been doing some of those auctions on the kiss live auctions page. So if you want to buy some things that are personally owned by a member of kiss, you guys can do that. Yep. Yep. You know, he's a good dude, man. He really is. And Lisa's really cool too. The very nice, nice couple. Um. So let's just, Let's get to um, Mark's fanboy moment. To what, 24 here? I don't know how many times he's gone fanboy, but he did it again. It's this tour that he's holding up the image for. Kiss, live in concert, Kobo Arena, the Creatures of the Night tour. Of course, it's nobody from Kiss that's here to talk about this. You know, I got a little teaser I'm going to send you for the promo. Um, by the time you hear this, I absolutely, I actually went out. It's only 30 seconds, but I, I bought the from, I don't, I think it's Mike, it, Tommy, you might, I got that chromatic thing transferred, Tommy. Oh, um, good. Okay. It, I, I got the, the, the commercial for the creature show here in Detroit. Mint TV. Oh, it's, thank you. But, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll use that for the teaser for the show this week. I'll just take a little video of it. But uh, let me tell you, I've said it once, I'll say it a thousand times. That show was the best concert I've ever been to by any band. And we have somebody this week who was on fucking stage that night. So we're really excited to have uh, this guest on. And they're going to well, introduce them. Introduce them. Guys, we have this, this week, we have West Beach from the Plasmatics. Uh, joining us who toured with Kiss during the Creatures of the Night tour. And he's got all kinds of great Wendy o. Williams stories and touring with Kiss stories, songwriting minutia we didn't know. And it's my life demo controversy. There is a minor, this is something I did not even know. I just assumed that the solo that we're used to was just the original solo but and we, we 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 learned something that now is going to put mark on the trail to track down what could be the original real demo we don't know we're going to find assume, out ask you <laughs> when you assume you make an ass and out of you and me. anyway yes this is a, a great conversation with wes plasmatics talk kiss talk blue oyster cult talk Alice Cooper talk. Alice Cooper, Wendy O. Williams, CBGBs. Yeah. Lots of cool little minutia this week. Also, he breaks my heart with a, a, a story about Kiss. 
what did Kiss not do for the Plasmatics that they did for ACDC and Bob Seger and the Jay Giles Band and Bon Jovi? Sell out the arena? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I am. That bothers me because I always prided myself that Kiss kept everything to a higher standard well, Wes says differently you gotta you gotta listen to what Wes is disappointed about maybe we need to get a guy from Kiss to come on and clear it up clear Nothing. it up clear it up <laughs> alright just let it let it roll <laughs> best speech from the plasmatics Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker T? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey, Three Sides fans. Very, very honored. And uh, look, you're going to see uh, quite a bit of fanboy Mark here. Because we have the one and only West Beach from the incredible Plasmatics with us today. And we're going to be talking Creatures of the Night tour. Uh, we're, gonna, we're going to find out stuff that even people like me didn't know. Because that tour, a lot of people said it was uh, horribly attended. That was not always the case. There was quite a, quite a few bright spots in that tour. And with that, Wes, welcome to the show. All right. Thank you. For Thanks for having us, me. Wes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm at, you know, Mark's all excited about creatures of the night, but I'm actually excited about talking to you about the, the wow album. Oh yeah. yeah the, the, it, wow. As, as, as kiss fans go, that is the greatest kiss album without a kiss logo on it. Right. right. <laughs> That's what they say. But, but, but let's, let's start all the way back here. Plasmatics metal priestess. No, 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 no. That's that's the hold on. I was actually going for New Hope for the Wretched. Oh. That's uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just grabbing all this. I forgot that, that when they reissued that, they put Metal Priestess on the I have the separate vinyls. I didn't feel like running into the other room and, and grab all that. But I, I tell you what, here's what I wanted to start with. Wes, how did you get involved? Because obviously they, the Plasmatics came out of the, the punk scene of New York. Right. How did you, because I think Richie was the only other original member, correct? Right. Uh-huh. He was. So how did, how did you glom on to that, uh, that, well, uh, kind, that... Of, kind of, a, kind of an interesting story. Uh, I actually, uh, was in a band before the Plasmatics and, uh, we were rehearsing one night and across the hall, a friend of mine's band from high school was playing who I hadn't seen in years. And he comes up to me and he goes, Hey, you want to go over to CBGB's and see my uh, aunt's boyfriend's band is playing. It's their first gig. So I said, okay, let's go check them out. So I went there and it was the first time the plasmatics were playing. And I really didn't care for the band, although Wendy was a riveting stage presence and I thought she was really great, but the band I didn't really care for. So a few months went by and there was an ad in the Village Voice looking for the world's fastest rhythm guitar player. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm a good guitar player. So let me audition for that. So I show up at the audition. It was in this lower Manhattan loft. It was in the basement and the pipes were low and sweating. And it was was really dank and kind of nasty. And as I was waiting my turn to audition, I, I heard him keep playing the same song over and over again. So I took my guitar out and I kind of learned the song. And when I went into audition, we played a couple plasmatic songs as they just released the 45 that I learned. And then they said, here, we want to teach you a song. And I says, well, I know that song already. I heard it, heard it while I was waiting for you. <laughs> so I went in there and played it and they were very impressed by that. So uh, they actually uh, had me come back two more times to audition before I finally joined the band. So right out of the gate, I mean, you had, a, a you know, when you, by the time you joined that record, um, you know, uh, uh, record deal and, um, you know, tour and y- y- there was, there was some production value behind it by the time you already got there. So they were already out of the, you know, I guess the, the bars. Yeah. There, was already, yeah. there was already a big buzz on the band. They, they were getting a lot of attention and promotion. So I kind of stepped into a really good situation. And the reason they wanted me in the band anyway, was to kind of give Richie a foundation to play over. 
Because when he would go and play his crazy wild lead, leads, the music kind of thinned out. So I was there to kind of bolster the sound. That makes total sense. Now, now you, you, you had mentioned, you know, Wendy, when you first saw her at that show, you know, was very captivating. Was that something you were into musically as well? Or did that not matter as much to you? Well, I, mean, I really, I, like I said, I really didn't care for the music at that time. But then, uh, you know, once I joined the band, I helped uh, push them along and maybe make it a little heavier and a little thicker sound. So I kind of joined and I, I, I learned to like it and uh, was playing real fast and hard and all downstrokes. So when you first when you first saw them, they were much more punk than than metal. Oh, yeah. Well, we were we were a punk band to start with. I mean, that's what they called us. We always thought right. of ourselves as a rock band. We never really thought of ourselves as a punk band. But of course, we got lumped into that. Well, it, it, took a while, was, it took a while to get to that uh, kind of metal progression. Yeah. Now, New Hope was the was the was the first one you were involved in. Correct. Right. Yeah, that was well, the first album. Yeah, because you co-wrote one of my favorite. Matter of fact, I before I even knew you were going to be on the show, I posted a, know, probably a month or two ago. I always love Monkey Suit. That tune, uh, yeah, yeah. that tune is. Just, I remember, man, that came out in nineteen eighty. Yes, I, uh, I remember. Like that was like the tune. <laughs> you just wanted to get crazy, you know, drive around with your friends or whatever. Monkey Suit did it every single time so uh, uh -huh. so what was uh what was the the single that you learned uh if it was at like butcher baby or what was it what did you, you yeah you it was uh, butcher baby and uh, fast food service and corruption it was the first single they put out so that would uh that that was kind of interesting that uh you know you learned it that way and got in there and got the gig um so tell me about recording uh uh you know uh New Hope for the Wretched. I mean, well, New Hope was kind of an kind of an ordeal. The producer on that, what we were on Stiff Records, and they brought in Jimmy Miller, who produced all the Rolling Stones records. But by this time, he was such a mess from you know hanging out with Keith Richards that uh, he was barely <laughs> there. He would he would nod off at the desk and he would leave for long periods of time. We'd be sitting around like, "Where's Jimmy? Where's Jimmy?" We'd have to search around the studio looking for him, and then he'd be nodded out in the ladies' bathroom. Jeez. That wasn't a good experience then? Uh, not the best, not the best, but uh, we managed to pull it together. It was mostly put together with uh, with their engineer. And we actually got Jimmy Jimmy Miller because we heard his stuff he did with Motorhead, and it was a really powerful sound, and that's what we were looking for. Um, it's kind of, this is kind of a weird fanboy kind of question because when Buck Dharma was on, they did some work with Neil Smith from Alice Cooper's band, and how did he get involved uh, with, with the next, I think it was the next record. Right, the next record, Beyond the Valley in 1984. Well, what happened was Neil came to see us play at a show in, uh, in uh, Connecticut, the Agora Ballroom in Connecticut. Him and Dennis Dunaway came. And they came backstage and were talking to us and our manager. And he said, hey, if you ever need a drummer, let me know. So when we were getting ready to do the Beyond uh, the Valley album, our drummer, Stu Deutsch, uh, decided that he was going to, try and get some more money out of management and that that didn't kind of work so uh, he left the band and we were short you know about two weeks before going into the studio so our manager rod swenson called up neil and said hey you want to play on the album and of course he did so that's how he got involved and he was he was really cool he had his old uh, alice cooper drum set with the mirrors on it and uh, every rehearsal before we started would make him play the introduction to billion dollar babies <laughs> <laughs> he you always did it it was really cool hey what did you think he was, he was that's a great guy to work with I, I absolutely love that record um it has probably one of my favorite plasmatic songs on it uh and i i was just curious master plan i absolutely love um but what'd you think of motorhead's cover uh it wasn't the best it was kind of loose <laughs> yeah i thought i thought i remember when i found out they were doing that that it would be better. They, don't get me wrong. I don't think it sucks. And I'm a huge motorhead fan. But I, I thought that Wendy, you know, Wendy just kills on that song. And I, I thought that Lemmy sat back a little too much on, on that. That song just needs that aggression. And right. I, absolutely. I, I think Lemmy was trying to calm it down a bit to trying to improve it. But I, I just don't think you can improve a song like that. Right. Um, Right. That, that song's just balls out, man. I fucking mm -hmm. love it. 
Well, it's funny you mentioned the Buck Dharma because there is kind of a Blue Oyster Cult Kiss Plasmatics connection there. Oh, let's hear it. We used to rehearse in Lower Manhattan, and then and well, we had the fifth floor loft where we rehearsed, and in the basement, Blue Oyster Cult stored all their equipment. So when they would go on tour, their tractor trailer would pull up and right in front of the loft, they load up all the equipment. So what we used to do is we used to go down into the basement and look around at all their stuff and check out their guitars. And I think I still got a couple of Blue Oyster Cult guitar picks because I was a big Blue Oyster Cult fan. Cool, I I am too. Um, that's that's a cool story. That's a really kind of a a groundbreaking. Or I thought it was, especially at the time, because nobody sounded like that. I mean, the Ramones had. The Ramon sound. I always thought like the Sex Pistols were more of a hard rock band. If you ever want, you know, everyone calls them punk, but you know, listen to those songs. I think they're kind of just hard rock songs. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the Plasmatics were really onto something lyrically, musically. I mean, Pig is a Pig. That, that the little country intro. I remember the first time I heard that. I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> but I mean, it, it worked. It was so fucking cool. But. Um, well, we like to push the we like to push the boundaries, try different things, and Wendy always liked to like to push everybody and and try different things, and she liked to really go for it. Cool. I, I thought uh, you know the next one moving forward, and I hope you don't mind me doing this, and then we can just talk about general stories. I just want to make sure I don't miss any of the of the music because I'm such a fan. I'll let get this in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Metal Priestess, I, I, you know, what can you tell me? when you guys did the SCTV because that version of black leather monster and Mike, I, I would love if you could edit that SCTV part into the show somehow. I don't know if we can, or well, if that, not, was the Doom, that was the doom song actually. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Dooms. I'm sorry about that. Black but, leather uh, monster you guys did black, was it solid gold. That was on solid gold. Solid gold right. Yeah. Um, I told you I'm a geek fan. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, what was that like? You guys did that whole skit with, uh, with uh, Candy. Oh, he, was, he was great. He was he was really fun to work with, and he was always on. He was always cracking jokes and laughing and having a good time. That is one of my favorite rock and roll video memories. And and if you guys can, that was what Gus F- the fishing musician. Fishing musician. Right? Oh yeah, we've talked about that a few times in the past here. <laughs> with yes. Gail Fisher. That's it. That's it. Um, if you guys get a chance before or after the show, you have, and it's that's probably a good eight minutes, isn't it? The whole the whole skit with you guys um, out out in the woods and and, right. and all that. Stuff. Mm-hmm. What can you What can you tell me? I mean, like whose idea was that? I mean, you guys all looked like you're having a fucking ball. Oh, I mean, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it was their idea. I think it was John Candy's idea or the or the writers for SCTV, and we just went along with it and uh, filmed it as we went. And it was up in Edmonton. That was my next question. Whereabouts in Canada was that film? Yeah, yeah. Way to hell out where in Nowheresville. <laughs> you guys had to stand out a little bit out uh, in the <laughs> middle of... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. And in those days when we would tour, you know, that was pre-MTV. So nobody in the heartlands had seen anything like us. I mean, we'd, we'd walk into a McDonald's and, and they would literally be silent. And everybody would come out and stare. <laughs> what the hell is this? You know, I see people coming out of the kitchen. That was pretty wild stuff. Well, I'm sure just Richie and Wendy alone walking in and then you guys following behind. I mean, that was quite the, I mean, because you did your look, I, I imagine, because you just had the, what, the, the spiky short hair. Right, the spiky hair, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, Richie and I'm sure Wendy leading the charge walking into a, you know, a coffee shop, I imagine it would. Uh, a truck stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> truck stops were, were definitely challenging places. There was one time we were in Texas and uh, this big burly guy was standing in the entrance to the truck stop. And I remember we walked in there with John Bouvard, you know, it was a black guy with a yep. white mohawk, which in yeah. Texas, he didn't see too much of that in those days. And the guy just looks at him. He goes, there's nothing in here for you boys. And John's <laughs> like, you know, he's a little wet behind the ears. He's like, oh yeah, no, I just want to go in here and get a soda. And he's like, there's nothing in here for you boys. And we just pulled him away. It's like, yeah, there's nothing in here for us. Let's go. Oh, wow. <laughs> And there's other times we'd go in, we'd sit, we'd go into a restaurant and families would just get up and leave because they could they couldn't take it. But you know, we had the whole road crew and stuff, so we're spending a lot of money. So they oh were glad God. to have us, but the families would leave. Um, what is this I, another one of my faves? I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep doing this. <laughs> the impetus for 12 noon, that recording, the woman who how did that go about being recorded? The uh uh, the hello over and over and over and uh, like 
Oh, just yeah, like but, the phone answering with Wendy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As of 12 noon tomorrow, say goodbye to the world as you know it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great intro. Yeah, all, again, all that stuff. That is such a great fucking uh, album. That that one, too, I thought was very well produced. I, I really think you guys kind of ramped it up um, on Metal Priestess. I think it kind of... That was really, I think, the between the the punk and the metal were right, really right. that's where the transition was starting right there it yeah. was starting and like i said to you privately man a lot of fans love it i gotta admit i'm i'm not a huge fan it's, it's okay it's not but 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 coup de todd is it it was too metal it was wendy before right, that right. was way more experimental again pig is a pig fast food service you know and then I thought when Coup d'etat came out, it was, it's good. You know, just, uh, you guys might remember, what was it? Uh, the, 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 what was the, The Damned was the head of the video on MTV. Right, that uh-huh. um, again, cool. I, I liked it, you know, didn't love it. I'm, I'm still, t- it's funny because here's where Michael and I veered. I again, I like the Wow album, but again, it lost some of that punky charm that uh, you know the earlier stuff did. And uh, and before we get on to the road stories and other stuff, I got to ask you about um, uh, all right, the, the Wow. The, how did how did Gene Simmons get involved and Wendy? And were you like all super supportive of that, or what are your memories of that? Well, I remember uh, we, we uh, were touring with Kiss on the Creatures Tour, and uh, we did like the first leg of the tour through the uh, Midwest, and then we were going back to New York to work on our next album. And then uh, after about three days, Kiss called us back and wanted us to come back. They pretty much begged us to come back and open some more dates for him because we helped them sell some tickets. So we did. We went back, toured through the uh, Midwest and the South. And then uh, we went back to, to work on the record. And then uh, we were getting some better reviews than Kiss at that time. So I don't know, maybe Gene wanted to try and latch on to that. I'm not sure. But uh, he wanted to produce a Wendy solo album. And to avoid any conflicts with the record companies, uh, they didn't want to use the Plasmatics name. So it was just going to be Wendy O. Williams solo album. And Gene actually wanted to bring in all different players on that. But Wendy, you know, stressed that she wanted to use her band. So that's how, you know, I I stayed involved with it. And our drummer, T.C. Tolliver. And Richie was also going to be involved. But uh, Gene didn't think he he liked his playing and couldn't cut it. So he was kind of scratched from the... uh, Wes, when, when, when that was happening, because to Mark's earlier point, the WOW album is a is a, a deviation in the plasmatic sound. It's a much more commercial. It's a much more, I don't, acceptable is not the right word, but it's a much more friendlier hard rock metal album than a, than a plasmatics album would be. Was that something that Wendy consciously wanted to try and go towards, or was it something that just kind of naturally happened, or was she pointed that direction? What led to the change of sound? Well, I think that was something that Gene wanted to do, and that's what he wanted to try and bring to it, was, you know, he was trying to polish it and make it more commercially viable, and I think I think he did a lot of that, and, you know, he had the, the gang backup vocals and the, uh, and the lead guitars, and you know, make it a little slicker, I think. And I think, yeah. I think that was mostly Gene. And, you know, of course, Wendy wanted to try different things. So she was, she was all for it. So there Were wasn't, the- I was just going to say oh, real quick. So there, as, as that was being recorded and worked on, you don't recall any resistance to the, the, the new sound, the new direction, everything, oh, no. everybody no, was pretty welcoming. Was the, no, I think it was more, it was a natural progression, you know, after we did the uh, coup d'etat album, which was a heavier, heavier metal album and then the wow album was a little more commercial you know as, as we were trying to 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 appeal more to the masses i think sure and i think a lot of that was you know gene's doing well a, a, again as, as as i alluded to up front it's you know it's a kiss album without the kiss logo on it 
it you know it sounds in that style so it's not it's not even what i would call in my personal opinion a heavy metal album it's a hard rock album which right, right. pretty pretty drastic change from a plasmatics album oh definitely yeah it was definitely a big change from plasmatics album because you guys were really tagged as a punk band, at least from my perspective, when I would read about it. I, I, I was aware of it because I had the second record at the time. Well, I think it was. When you guys first got billed coming here with uh, the Creatures of the Night Tour, I'm like, this is great. Everyone was really excited because we knew you to be more of just a hard, like Mark said, a hard rock band. Did you guys ever feel like you were so typecast is probably not the right word but just kind of stuck in a, in a spot where you ne didn't necessarily felt like you would should be no i don't think at all because you know, we always progressed we never i don't think we ever put the same record out twice you know we weren't like the ramones or motorhead where every record sounds the same or ac dc right I mean, every record we did was different and kind of a change from the one previous to it i think and I well think yeah that's and I, consciously done yeah because it just seems to me like when the wow album came out then that whole thing really shifted where they were then like maybe it's changed because kerrang became more popular but then i felt like you know like wendy o williams was getting more coverage in the rock magazines and the metal magazines than i ever saw with the plasmatics in some of those similar magazines so there was definitely a shift from a fan's perspective or the media at least feeding it to us as teenage kids mm -hmm. and you know, I was just wondering if if that it, the natural progressive was just something you never thought about. You guys were just doing your thing. Yeah, we were just doing our thing, and that was you know that's just the way it was. Now, now we know on the Wow album, Gene brought in a whole bunch of the Kiss guys to do co-writes and you know work on it as well. Um, were you involved in any of the and you know any of the stuff that he brought in from the other Kiss guys? Oh sure, yeah. What do you remember about working with, you know, whether it was Ace or Paul? Well, I didn't, I didn't, Vinny? I didn't work with Ace, but I, I spent a day in a studio with Paul going through songs for, see what he felt comfortable with and showed him, you know, how to play them, the chord progressions, things like that. And he ended up playing on uh, Ready to Rock. Hey, did you play, did you play on any of the, um, along with Eric Carr when he was doing his drum parts? No. Oh, so you didn't do any of the scratch work on on, on that? No, he, he just did uh, backing vocals uh, when I was with him. No, the track uh, the track he played on, they had already recorded, and Wendy just sang on it. But all the other tracks uh, was me and our drummer, T.C. Tolliver, playing drums. And actually, in the studio, it was kind of funny, because uh, Eric Carr went up to Gene, he says, hey, Gene, how come my drums didn't sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> But they were just coming off creatures. They were dying. Right, I know, and that was a great sounding album. It really was. So when 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 the Wow album was finished, it came out on Passport Records, I think. Um, was there issues of trying to find a major label at that uh, time? There was, and there was, and they could never find the right one, I suppose, and that's how that happened. So I think uh, as a result, it really didn't get kind of the push and the promotion it should have. I yeah, that that was my that was my feeling. Is it just it it had great names behind it, great legacy behind it, great songs, definitely great songs, and somehow it just, as we sadly know about so many of them, it somehow mm -hmm. just fell through the cracks. Wrong right, place, right. wrong time, wrong label, whatever it was. Was that mm -hmm. was that frustrating? Did you guys all feel coming out of that with it a completed album? Going, wow, this actually feels like this should be our break this should bust us through yeah yeah absolutely yeah it was kind of disappointing that it didn't do better than it than it should have what did you, what did you think when you first heard uh um it's my life i mean obviously they had to have played you the kiss demo first i would imagine uh you know i I'm, I'm, i've been trying to find a copy of that original kiss demo and i've spent a thousand dollars probably trying to get it and i've never found it all, well, these, I, all these all these all uh, these recordings that they claim are the kiss demo aren't and i know well, why because it's my guitar solo on there is on I every actually, one hold on i actually and anybody who bought gene simmons vault have the demo to that song 
that's not the demo. That's my guitar solo. So I don't know what it is. I don't know who's playing it. It's not the it's not the uh, creatures demo. Oh, it's not. So they're no, because it's my guitar solo. And I and I wrote that solo, you know, for the Wow album. Hmm. He reports it to be the Kiss, you know, demo, but it's not. And there's That's some other ones. Circ- there's some other ones circulating, and it's actually Gene singing over Art backing track as a guide for Wendy to learn the vocals to that song. And if you listen carefully to to our to the Wow version, you can hear. If you put headphones on, you can hear Gene faintly in the background. Because it was picked up when uh, from my guitar pickups when they were recording it with Wendy, and you can hear it. It's it's pretty funny. All right, so I just so I get this story straight, because I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, I'm as soon as it's over, because I'm a geek that way. Mark Mark's got a nose for tracking stuff down <laughs> like this, and I love this. I love when we have a guest who comes on and pretty much straightens him out. So this is <laughs> so please. So, so, the, so the, the Kiss demo, the original Kiss demo from 82, before you heard it, should have a different guitar solo on it. Or that is, hold on. If it does have your guitar solo on it, then the one in the vault is not the original demo. Is that what you're telling me? Right, right. Unless they overdub my solo into it, which, you know, is anything's possible. All right. So the solo then that I'm used to is also the one that when they did the 98 re-record. Right. That's your, I love that song. It's so, oh. it sings songy. I am a geek for that song because I still think Kiss made a big mistake in giving it to you guys. Here we go I again, think, Tommy. Yeah, they should, they should have, <laughs> you know, Kiss should have kept that just, song and made a video. Mark, I, what, 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 what's, what's Mark, lo- Mark loves It's My Life so much that about once a month he tells us <laughs> once again that Kiss should have released it as a single. It would have been huge. It would have saved Kiss. The world would be different. <laughs> and then Wes would have had a big part of it because he came up with that kick ass solo. Well, on the, on the box set version, they actually changed the fourth. Uh, at the very end of the solo, they changed it a little bit. But other versions I've had, they play it pretty much note for note with the solo I came up with. That's cool. That's cool. And I've been trying to find like recordings of the rehearsals to try and see if I could come up with the It's My Life. But I'm not sure if we, if I even ever heard original recording of it. It might have just been Gene showing us the chord changes in the uh, studio. Yeah, like I said, I have the version. I believe I have i never a beat them you know i guess i just never the there i do have one it's my life that i had before the box set came out and then there was, there's the one on the you know the vault box set so i don't know i'll, I'll a b those and see but uh, if there's a different solo then that would have to be the original kiss one because you obviously hadn't put that solo right to it right well trust yeah. me wes mark will find, find it. it let me know he will find <laughs> it he just might we'll do, <laughs> we'll do. Um, Wes, here's everything that's going on today. So, so Wendy, just for put it this way, because we got a lot of young fans, and not everybody is is this geeky plasmatics fan like 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 I am and we are. Um, the you guys do the 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 metal thing, meaning the harder rock metal thing, and then you come back with this gem, which I absolutely love. Oh, um, classic, and. You guys nailed it by about 40 years. <laughs> if right. you guys don't know uh, about Maggots the Record, it's basically about a pandemic. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, pretty disturbing when you listen to it. I mean, it's obviously a lot more apocalyptic and on the, the Maggots record, but kind of hits home today. It's uh, Yeah, oh, sure. W- what do you remember coming up with the concept uh, of that or anybody said, Hey, we're going to do a concept record. Cause it was an about face for you guys. You were doing the hard rock thing, hard rock thing, commanders, of chaos, blah, blah, blah. And then. Although don't worry. Yeah. This is very metal too, but I thought it was a little bit more extreme metal than, than say, you know, the stuff you were doing on coup d'etat and stuff like that. So what do you, what are your recollections of maggots? Which well, I actually, either- actually I, I had left the band for about six months. I had just gotten kind of disenchanted with the whole thing after years of touring and writing and touring and writing. Uh, and Wendy was actually in St. Louis doing the Rocky horror 
show doing a live version of that and we were in back in new york in the winter freezing our asses off in a rehearsal loft writing songs for the next record and i was going through some personal things and i just had to take a break and so i left the band for a while and so they went they did commander chaos which i think uh, was one of the first thrash metal albums because that was just all balls to the wall speed metal but uh after that i helped associate produce that record and then uh i was living in detroit at the time and they were writing the songs for maggots and uh, rod swenson called me up and said hey you want to come down and help produce the maggots record i said sure i'll come down so i went to new york and they were looking for a song so i wrote a song for that propagators and he says oh you, you want to play some guitar on this i said oh sure yeah why not so I started playing guitar. Next thing I know, I'm back in the band and uh, working on it and producing it and writing the songs. And well, that's what I mean. I knew you were when you said you were. I'm like, God, I've stared at that album cover a million times. I know you're on it. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Wes, Wes, was was the Plasmatics run as a band, or was it pretty much Wendy deciding the direction and what was going to be done, and you guys just had to follow along? Uh, no, I, th I think it was a band. I mean, it was an all, it was a group effort. And, uh, you know, Wendy would come up with things. We would come up with things. And uh, But didn't Rod kind of have an iron fist on stuff? It sure seemed like it, me just reading everything I've read about the band, that he, you know, he was kind of the figurehead. Is, right. is that well, well, he, he, he you know, he, he gave us a direction and, uh, you know, he had the, the final say in songs and material, things like that, and wrote a lot of the lyrics. So what are uh, it, was, it was a band effort, I think. Uh, this will be the final, at least for now, the final record one. As we all know, after we'll put it this way, you know, if you're a big plasmatics fan, after the Maggots record, you want to talk about left field. I didn't realize till just recently, Wes, that you were involved in the rap stuff. Oh yeah, it was uh, me and a drum machine wrote the whole album. Yeah, how the fuck? I, I got, I got to admit, I, to this day, I can't get through it. It just, and I love old school rap. Matter of fact, I've rapped on this show. I, I love old. Is that what you call it? Hey, I'm good. I, I missed you. You did ask Lisa. I was busting some fucking Humpty Dance a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll start. No, 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 please. No, 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 no. I believe you. Got to get my kanga out, man. <laughs> So, so tell me, how did enough? How in the fuck did did that come about, Wes? Well, we heard we heard uh, Wendy heard Blondie's Rapture song, which was kind of Blondie rapping, pretty lamely, but she said she could she could do it better. So that's pretty much uh, what the impetus was. And I studied a lot of uh, Run DMC and uh, LL Cool J things like that. I, you know, liberally borrowed a few beats and things from them, and uh, put basically put the album together and. We did it in a couple weekends. It was really kind of a quick thing. And uh, Wendy came in and rapped over it. And it was pretty cool. It was probably one of the first metal rap hybrid albums, I think. Yeah, it, it would have. Again, I, you know, I could, I, to this day, I can't get through it. Maybe, you know, I, that's the only album I don't own. I just heard enough of it. And I'm like, eh, I don't know if I like this. What, 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 <laughs> you know, you, you had mentioned that, you know, the Plasmatics never recorded the same album twice, which that in itself says a lot about how strong a band is, that they believe enough to do something different every time. But looking back now, do you think that is also maybe one of the obstacles that prevented the band from really breaking out? Because all of a sudden you do one album and people fall in love with it. And then the next album is wow, or rap, or a complete change, right field change that all of a sudden those fans are like, well, they lost me here. I mean, do you well, think that might've been an issue? No, not really. We, we always like to do what we wanted to do. And uh, you know, when Wendy always wanted to do what you wanted to do, and that, that's just the way we were. And we didn't really think about that, you know? Hey, speaking of Blondie, what did you think of Debbie Harry's cover of Sometimes I? I, I mean, oh, that was good. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. That was cool, yeah. And, and and also, too, moving up to modern day 2020, what the, I, I was flipping through uh, 
Facebook and someone posted a picture of Miley Cyrus with the plasmatic her, shirt. And I'm like, fuck, that's the plasma. She's wearing a plasmatic shirt. And then I don't know if it's the name of her record or she has a band called Plastic Something. She yeah, plastic, used the plastic car. She used the, she kind of ripped off our logo. Kind of. The font <laughs> from the plasmatics. Jesus Christ, right. that's fucking spot on, fucking total rip off. I mean, look, you, you know, you tip your hat to the greats. I was happy to see it, but. Man, it wasn't even, she wasn't even trying to sugarcoat it. It was like, hey, I'm ripping. Oh, blatant. Right. It's pretty oh. blatant, but uh, well, at oh. least she could, she could have worn an officially sanctioned uh, shirt instead of a bootleg. <laughs> exactly. At least she could have gotten a few pennies out of it, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wes, let's go back to the Creatures of the Night tour. So, so we can, we can appease the, the, the Kiss fans here. Um, you know, in the, in, in, the world of KISS fans, the Creatures of the Night tours looked at very fondly by KISS fans. It is like the tour they wished they could have seen because it was a fairly short tour, got canceled. As we all know, KISS was pretty much dead in the United States at that point in time. Um, but KISS was back musically with that album. They released a metal album you know, it could be argued, heaviest Kiss album they've ever done. Um, the fans loved it musically. The tour was brilliant. I mean, it was, we all saw the Creatures tour. It was my first Kiss concert in um, Minneapolis, Bloomington, Minnesota at the Met Center. How did that tour come about for the Plasmatics? Well, I think uh, the record company wanted to get us out there to, to bigger audiences. And there was talk about us touring with maybe Ozzy Osbourne or Judas Priest. And uh, I think uh, Sharon Osbourne kind of put the kibosh on us touring with Ozzy because she was afraid he was going to be enamored with Wendy. So that never happened. And uh, and I guess uh, Kiss just, like I said, they, they needed somebody to help fill some seats. And uh, that's how we came about uh, touring with them. So did you did do you recall was there any concern that oh maybe we're taking the plasmatics now into more of a a commercial crowd that's not really familiar with the plasmatics beyond Wendy's shocking tactics on stage and the name I mean well, was no, that I, I think you know we were just trying to uh, to appeal to a wider audience and get out there a little more uh because you know Wendy was a very controversial figure and uh just to, you know, bring it to middle America was kind of a cool thing to do. I, th I thought it was really nice. And the thing was, uh, Kiss had promised us a sound check every night. And uh, the first time uh, we, we played with them was in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And I remember them playing Deuce and when they were doing their sound check. And they played a great version of that. And they never played that song on the tour. Actually, they did. They played did it. They? In... Yeah, at, Mike. At, at... Yeah, Mike wrote down this tell us. You, yeah, you, at, at Bloomington, you know Minnesota, show. Minneapolis, uh, Met Center. Really? Because I don't remember. I don't remember them playing that. But anyway, right. so they did their sound check, and it kind of ran late, and we never got to do a sound check. So we figure, okay, maybe the next night we'll we'll get our sound check. So the next night we were in Nashville, and the same thing happened. Kiss kept playing and playing, and uh, we didn't get a sound check. So this seemed to set the tone for the whole tour. Finally, we get to Detroit. Kiss comes off the stage and says, okay, now you guys can, can do your sound check. So we run up to plug in our amps and all of a sudden they open up the doors and the crowd starts filing in. So I was like, okay, we can't do the sound check. And we never did get a sound check on the entire tour. I'm surprised because a lot of, you know, from ACDC on back, Bob Seeger, I'm sure you've read those things too. They all say how well Kiss treated them on tour. Kind of breaks my heart that they didn't keep their work with you guys. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was kind of disappointing. I don't think I heard a note I played on that entire tour. Well, I tell you what, you guys, I was at the Kobo show. You guys certainly resonated with the crowd. That was, uh, yeah. I, you know, I've said it publicly many times, that concert, the, the two bands, I've seen Kiss a couple hundred times. I've seen thousands of shows. I've been at just about every heavy metal concert that ever had, you know, had at Kobo. Shit, I spent all my time there. And that night, February 23rd, 1983 man what a what a that just beat me over the head both plasmatics and kiss were both on their game i was right up front i'll never forget when tickets went on sale for that show 
we had really bad weather. And I remember I went down to the Hudson's to get, you mm-hmm. know, if you guys remember that store. Did you guys have those out in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Did you guys have no. Hudson's? That was a big, that was a big, well, that was a big store in Detroit. And I remember I fight my way through the weather and I get there, I'm like the first person. And I was never, ever the first person. Of course, in your head, you're like, oh my God, I'm the mm-hmm. first. And then you're like, oh, huh. Toward and saw that well. Although the the Detroit show, I remember Kobo being almost full. Just Tier C was kind of empty. Right. That was that was one of the the better sold shows. Detroit and Cleveland were the two biggest shows, I think, on that on the dates that we did well. Yeah, I you know I've seen in some of the official Kiss books, they're like you know six seven thousand. Like bullshit because Kobo held twelve twelve thousand five sold out. Tier A, Tier B was filled. Tier C was spotty. Tier C was the very upper. Right. If you're looking at the back of Kiss Alive, that very upper part. Uh-huh. Rest was full. I mean, I'm, I'm going to estimate there's about 10,000 people there. And I would say 10,000 people for a band 10 years into their career is not bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's yeah, that pretty was, That was a good show. I remember, I remember that. And I also remember backstage at Kobo how how dingy and dank it was with the broken windows and rusty pipes. And it's like, because I, you know, I heard about Kobo growing up in New York and I, I was really excited to be playing there. And then I was a little disappointed. It was kind of shabby. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other uh, tour dates that, because again, there was quite a few that were pretty well sold and, and, you know, very enthusiastic crowds um you know we had your... some good we had some good crowds in texas was really good like san antonio and el paso uh, hey, how did you deal how did, how did you personally deal there was a lot of protests at the time i was going to ask you i mean that whole tour whether it was intentionally done or not was always filled with religious protests i mean right. tommy and i in, in at bloomington minnesota i mean there was record oh. burnings being held out in the parking lot and the peters brothers peters. peters brothers did their interview with gene and paul and you know they were they were talking about the whole you know it it almost looking back now you feel like they were trying to create this religious controversy to help sell tickets but what do you remember about all the protesting Right. I, rem- I remember all those protests. It was really something. It was, uh, I don't know, it was, it was kind of crazy. It was like almost in every city, that would be the big news. And in those days, that was big news. When Kiss came to town, it'd be on the news and they'd show the protests and they'd show the preachers railing against them. And, uh, and, it, you know, and, it, and it didn't, it didn't help. It didn't help Kiss to have the plasmatics touring with them because they they would always then focus also on wendy and how she'd be topless or have have shaving cream all over and she'd blow up stuff and you know it it as as a teenager back then you were like this is cool this is great i love it yeah but yeah man the 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 religious protests yeah it was pretty crazy off the hook and we used to wheel out a giant pentagram in the middle of the stage, and but they never said anything about that. They were just too too focused on Kiss and what they were doing. I wanted to ask you real quick, Wes. You know, because obviously we know Kiss is known for their stage show, and so is the Plasmatics. I mean, you're very well known for you know the over the top stage presentation. Did did Kiss put any limits on what the Plasmatics could do from a stage show? aspect on that tour not not that not that i remember I, i'm sure they did uh you know as far as the sound and lighting went but I, they didn't really uh uh do anything as far as you know we always did the chainsaw and the guitar at the end but they, they might have curtailed any of the explosions things like that we couldn't do so do you I'm feel sure do you, do you feel it. like you were actually giving kiss a run for their money on that tour because again we know that that in popularity wise kiss was pretty much at their absolute lowest at that point in the u.s again i'm only talking u.s here um do you think you you guys were going out there and blowing them away and putting the pressure on them well i'm sure we i'm sure we were like i said we there was a lot of times that we got uh, better publicity in the papers and better reviews i mean i remember one headline was like a tired tired kiss and plasmatics new blood or things like that and uh, that's true i have a bunch of press articles from that tour and you're spot on they 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 were certainly eyeing the young blood 
um, as, as, as you guys were, I mean, you know, cause it was shock rock taken to a new level. I mean, yep, right. exactly. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, Wes, I'd I'm like sure, to, I'm sure that uh, bothered Gene and Paul quite a bit. Oh, it, it, it probably yeah. did, but at the same point, they were probably like, Hey, anything that'll help us sell tickets and, oh, yeah. and, and keep sure. the band moving forward at that point in time, they were willing to do because mm-hmm. in, in, in a past podcast episode, we actually looked at a couple old kiss contracts. We had a contract from the creatures of the night tour and a contract from, was it 78 Mark? Was it the mm-hmm. love gun tour? Love gun tour. 77. And yeah. You know, and in 77, they kiss was being guaranteed $40,000 a show, but on the creatures of the night tour, they were being guaranteed 10,000 a show. And that's a pretty big drop in a guarantee in just a few years time. You know, the spotlight, the shine was off of kiss by that point in time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm sure, yeah, lot, I'm sure, I'm sure, shows, I'm sure Gene and Paul were quite happy that you were keeping the attention on the tour. Right. Right. And a lot of, a lot of shows were canceled. I mean, we'd be going, uh, you know, driving to a, to a town and they said, Oh, that show's canceled. We'll have to go somewhere else and just keep going. So a lot, a lot of dates were falling by the wayside. It was supposed to be like a hundred day tour. And I don't, I don't know how many they ended it up ended doing, up like 50, 50 some dates, I think. Yeah. Wes, are you still in New York city now? Oh no, I'm in the Detroit suburbs. Okay, can you tell our listeners a little bit what it was like in the 70s and 80s when you were in New York City? What, it, what was it like? What was interesting to you as far as the music uh, scene, uh, CBGBs? Can you tell us a little bit about what it was well, like? I used, to I, used to, I used to call it, it was like Paris in the 20s. It was really exciting. I mean, it, the bands were great. Uh, CBGBs was always packed. We were like the first band to charge ten dollars to get in there, and it'd be lines around the block to get in. And it was just, you know, it's just a little dirty, dingy little club, but it would be packed to the rafters. I mean, the first time I played there, I had to like fight my way in to get to the backstage area. People didn't believe I was even in the band. What year was that? Uh, Seventy-nine. Okay, so then, did you see? um the talking heads and blondie and the ramones at cbgb's oh absolutely yeah i used to go there regularly the band i was in before the plasmatics used to play there pretty regularly and would go there and uh if the thing about cbgb's is if you went there in the early afternoon and just uh, sat at the bar and had a couple beers you wouldn't have to pay the cover charge when the bands came on but i saw bands like talking heads the first time they played there and television blondie the Ramones, Dead Boys, uh, The Damned. I mean, so many bands. It was just incredible. Were you um, surprised by the success that many of those bands had? Or did you feel it in seeing them? Because like for me, just as a, a kid in the Midwest, I've always been enamored of, of New York because there was so much great music coming out of there. And I love Blondie, but Blondie to me felt... And I, I understand the whole punk thing with, with Debbie Harry, but if it was a pop band to me. So I had a very hard time as a kid understanding how they were lumped in with the Ramones and the Talking Heads and some of the other bands from the time. So was it, did it start out a lot more of a punk feel for them and then they evolved into a pop type band? Or did you think, wow, these guys, they're going to do great right off the bat? Yeah, they, they had the, you know, they had the look and the sound and, they, and real, real lot of talent in that band. So, you know, I think they were going to go places. Sure, you could see that. And it was a progression, you know. Was it, was it the music that drew people to CBGBs or was it also the fact that it was considered a great place to hang out? I think both. I think both. But you could, you could always guarantee some good, good music there and it was a good place to hang out. And I used to hang out there all the time. And that's just you... when when rent was reasonable, wasn't it? I mean, you guys could get an apartment that wouldn't uh, break the bank. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I was a I was a Long Island kid, so I'd commute from Long Island into the city all the time. That explains your VOC fandom. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, in the Long Island band. Yeah. Did hey, you what, ever, you know speaking of Kiss did you ever see Kiss before touring I did them? not no I but I was I was a fan of their first first uh three albums and then I kind of 
fell away from it for a while. I remember a friend of mine and I went to a, a diner on Long Island when the strutter came out on a 45 and we played the flip side, nothing to lose. So, so incessantly that they threw us out <laughs> playing it over and over. That's cool. Hey, Wes, what, at, at, back to CBGB's real quick. Is there a band that you recall seeing there that never made it, but you thought had it, that you thought was phenomenal? Uh, probably quite a few. There was a band, uh, trying, trying to think of their name. But there, there, was, there was quite a few bands that, that never made. I mean, my, the band I was in before, the Plasmatics, I thought was really good. We had a lot of really good songs and talent, and we never made it. We, couldn't, we could never get the weekend gig. We were like big uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night. And we actually opened for the Dead Boys the first time they played at CBGB's, which was pretty cool. Yeah, I dig them. Yeah. Hey, speaking of, I don't know if it was, where was the incident? Was that Cleveland or Cincinnati? We're with Wendy and the police. And can you well, take Cleveland, a back? Milwaukee, Milwaukee. Was Milwaukee. Damn, Michigan. it wasn't Ohio. It wasn't Ohio. Yeah, yeah, what could you take yeah. us back to that? I never, you know, and it's funny because I can't remember the name of the book that the guy from uh, Cream wrote. I have it. I can't remember the Dauphin, Edward Dauphin. I don't know if you're familiar with the. Oh, yeah, your heart and your mouth. Yes, yes, yes. I mm -hmm. I still, that whole story, can you, can you go into as much detail as you're comfortable with or whatever? What happened in Milwaukee exactly? Well, uh, they had seven of the uh, Milwaukee Vice Squad detectives were at, the, at our show. And they saw Wendy, you know, doing the show we all over the country, nothing different. And uh, after the show, they busted her for uh, pandering obscenity. And they, as they were taking her out the back, and I, I didn't actually witness this. I was in the, in the dressing room, but they arrested her and they were taking her into the paddy wagon and the one cop grabbed her ass and she, as she turned around to defend herself, he dragged her off the back of the wagon and started beating her with his club. And then our manager, Rod Swenson, came to her defense and they beat him up. And then uh, Jean Beauvoir was back there, our bass player, and they, they beat him up. And they beat Wendy up really bad. It, Bit, bit, beat up our manager really bad. It was, it was something. It was, I, I felt, you know, kind of ashamed to be part of America at that point because we always had a good relationship with police departments in New York. You know, they always helped us and uh, we never had any problem. But there, they were just kind of out of control. And the funny thing was, there was a topless bar right across the street from the club we were playing at. Things have changed. You know, I wonder why Milwaukee, like you, like you said, you've gone to the heartland and you guys played your shows. You've been all over the place. It's, it's weird. You'd think that, that that would have been more of a Southern thing. Well, it was just threatening. You know, Wendy was a very threatening image. The band was a very threatening image to a lot of people because they, they, they weren't used to a powerful female front person. I was going to say, she's a very, she was a very strong woman who, knew what she wanted and went out and got it and didn't care what anybody else thought of what she was doing. And mm -hmm. to some people that's scary. Right. Right. To a lot of people that was scary. And that was part of the reason I think that, you know, we never broke through to, to the masses and we never got any radio airplay. And even with the, when we did the damned video and we were on Capitol records that, you know, they only showed that at like four in the morning on MTV. Well, think about it. You always, again, I always say on the show, timeline is everything. 1981, 82, Pat Benatar, Ario Speedwagon, Journey, Plasmatics don't fit in, you know, with, with that, uh, unfortunately. But then again, you know, kids like us, it found us. Or we found them. I mean, you know, um, loved them, you know. That was the great thing about, I, I got to tell you what, even tip of the cap to like Hit Parade are covered you know, the plasmatics and, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't so much have to always go to the U, the UK magazines, you know, they rock scene covered, uh, you know, right, rock covered, scene, cream magazine. Cream, yeah. yeah. Oh, cream, especially covered, uh, mm -hmm. covered Wendy. As a matter of fact, they made her the cream dream one. Right. Uh -huh. You know, um, um, you know, so, I mean, you guys certainly got, uh, certainly got the press there. So we were media darlings for quite a while. That's for sure. Well, you know, Wendy did a ton of like Radio 1990 and uh, did the, uh, what do you call it? A lot of the 
maybe tier B sort of talk shows. I mean, she was, she I, I, I just listened to the, the night flight interview, right? That mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason, the night flight interview with Wendy is up on Spotify. Now there's no music. It's just all of the interview segments. And it was about promoting the wow album. Right. They put that out on a CD actually. Okay. And then the tomorrow show appearance. That was awesome. You know, Oh yeah, with Tom Snyder, that that was really pretty yeah. wild, because it, yeah. it, it was funny because they weren't they weren't uh, used to playing live bands, so certainly not with our decibel level, and we would play, and and Tom Snyder was sitting in a chair right in front of the band, and then the audience was behind him, so it was a little kind of disconcerting to be playing because there's Tom sitting there looking at the band. The well, speaking of playing. speaking of which go back in time you want to talk about the difference between the early 80s and and say say we didn't have a pandemic say 2020 was a normal year um even what you guys did blowing up the car how in the fuck did you get that into the theaters you guys played? <laughs> it wasn't easy i'll tell you what they used to do is they used to take out like the fire marshal to dinner while we were you know sound checking and when we were doing the show so he wouldn't see what we were doing i mean could that fucking hood i mean that that's no joke i mean that oh thing no the whole thing was 15, no joke yeah 15 feet in the fucking air and lord knows if it would come to i don't know look you guys missed out some huge lawsuits because if that fucking oh hood yeah would, to the audience you guys i'm surprised nobody got hurt yeah and uh i think it was you didn't who but although i know you weren't they used to hang you in effigy or right they, they used to hang me yeah yeah that was... again you know just being a geeky fan and, and yeah. that. <laughs> that's some great stuff man so but, you oh, know, Wes, we, we kind of what... made it up as we went along you know nobody uh there was really no template, you know, we were just blowing stuff up and uh, well, how about somebody going on the edge of the stage with a fucking machine gun now? I mean, Wendy, Wendy would shoot, a, you know, obviously blanks into the fucking crowd with a fucking gun. Yeah. <laughs> could, could you imagine that happening? Right. Now? No, That's no, no you joke, can't. man. You watch some of that old footage. I mean, she's got that. Da, 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 da. I mean, I'm like, motherfucker well that was a real machine gun and she had to be federally we had to be federally licensed to, to have it to even own it so that was, that was uh, those were the days <laughs> you can say yeah, that again. <laughs> well, what Wes, what 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 are you up to now what are you working on now uh um, i mostly just uh, play for my own amusement these days i still i still play and still uh, keep the fingers limber and still write songs but uh kind of been pretty uh inactive as far as any live playing things like that the last thing i did was uh, in 2016 in uh, rochester new york they inducted wendy into the rochester music hall of fame and we had uh, sheree curry come up and sing the damned and uh, butcher baby with us which was really cool that's awesome Got a chance to work with her she's really nice are you uh still in touch with anybody from back in the day yeah, I, st I still talk to, to, to some of them, most of them. Uh, I haven't spoken to like Richie in a while, in a, in a while but that, I probably haven't talked to him in a few years. But I stay in touch with uh, T.C. Tolliver and uh, our bassist Greg Smith from the WOW Tour. Talk to him. He's he's actually real active. He's played with uh, Alice Cooper and Rainbow and has been Ted Nugent's bass player for a number of years now. He's a monster player. Oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's got good voice too. He's, but he's, he's he started out with the plasmatics. We took him out on the road when he was uh, eighteen, I think, and uh, taught him everything he knew. Broke him in. Cool. Well, um, I, I want to say you know thing because we're going to wrap up here. Uh, now's a good time. Is there anything you want to plug? I know Mike said you know what are you up to, but is there anything that you you know you have a website or well you yeah I, I still help administer a plasmatics.com where all the cds are available we have some t-shirts and posters and some uh some test pressings and some uh uh promo albums we've got the promo uh of uh i love sex and uh, rock and roll on there which uh, is hard to find these days hey do you uh you sell that stuff out of your house 
Who else? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's you know. Mark. Mark will be over to visit. Be over, so don't give a visit. Don't give him your address. <laughs> I'm just giving you friendly advice. But you know, anybody, anybody wants to can order it if they like. I, I'll be glad to autograph anything. Just put it in the comment section. And uh... excellent. It's pretty excellent. Cool. Excellent. And I'm a, I'm a big Kiss fan. I still get stuff. I got the. Uh, I got this is the real creatures cover that it should hold have been. It, uh, the, oh, lift it up because it, hold, hold it up higher. Oh, with, with Vinny on it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was sweet. a Christmas present to myself. Nice. Yeah, that that, cool. that album stands the test of time for sure. Oh, it's a great album. I think that's the greatest uh, version of Kiss. I mean, that was the heaviest. I, I'm a big Vinny Vincent fan. And I used to see him when he was working in the guitar stores in New York before he was in Kiss. And he's, he was a real nice guy. Do, do you, I mean, obviously now that we look back and we know history that obviously there was a lot of tension between Gene and Paul and Vinnie Vincent. Oh, um, do you recall anything during? Oh, they were always before? yelling at him. I remember after the shows, they'd be yelling at him and, uh, you know, telling him to, to, to play better or, or uh, be better on the stage because he had those platform boots on and he'd walk like he was walking on eggshells and they were always giving him a hard time about that. And uh, it, it was pretty funny. Yeah, that was that was a that was a clash of of egos there. Gene and Paul versus Vinny Vincent. Lots of ego there. And Vinny, obviously, we know Vinny ended up going solo. He wanted to be the star and you right. can't you can't right. be the star when you're playing with gene simmons and paul stanley right yeah that's for sure but that but with eric and him that was that was uh quite a quite a sound eric, eric was a yeah. monster on those drums that he I'm was sure. yep yeah and he was a real sweetheart he used to come see us at, at club dates in new york too after we toured with them see, that's what i was going to ask i guess kind of a party question did you after the Kiss store, did you remain friends with Vinny and, and Eric and see much of them or even oh, Gene? Yeah, well, I, I would see him uh, like at trade shows and things like that and, uh, and always talk to them. They were always real friendly. And I remember I saw, uh, I went backstage on the Asylum tour and saw Bruce because, you know, I got a co write credit on Love's a Deadly Weapon. Mm, that's right. And uh, I saw Bruce there. Bruce is like, oh, yeah, that's a great song, but it's too fast for Paul to play. Well, they never played it live. <laughs> it's those little tidbits like that that fans love. Don't they love and they don't know that that's why certain songs by any band aren't played because one guy just hates the song or it's too fast for this guy to play or mm -hmm. it, there's always little things like that that people just don't understand. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, Wes... actually, actually, Jean uh, got that song from. Uh, I wrote it for Wendy for her Commander Chaos album. It was a song called Party, and Gene was was slated to produce that record, but uh, due to his scheduling, he couldn't do it. So he came to a pre production, and he heard the song and he says, oh, "I I like that. I think we'll use it." He took it back and turned it into "Loves a Deadly Weapon." <laughs> And the funny thing was, you know, I wrote it as kind of in the vein of Motorhead. It was like a Motorhead song. And before it had lyrics, that's what we used to call it. We called it the Motorhead song. And it was funny that Kiss took it and, and played it. They changed it a little bit, but it still had the same kind of feel. And uh... I love stuff like this. Mm -hmm. A little minutia. <laughs> Well, Wes, this was this was fabulous. Thank you so much for uh, sitting down with us, sharing some plasmatic stories, Wendy's stories, touring with Kiss. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Thanks, thanks for having me. I feel honored it's, to be on it. It's 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 the era of Kiss that, again, we're most fascinated with, but it feels like there's not as much known about it just because of when it was. It was in their downtime there was no internet i mean it was just you know we're all we're always trying to find those little tidbits of people who were around during that era and especially the wow album mm -hmm. I mean, again for kiss fans they just they love that album everybody except mark it's good it's just good it's not great it's, it's good. great i just listened to it yesterday 
It's still great. It's still good. I got, got some good good tunes on there for sure. Yeah, it I does. mean, I I I love it. I love that album. Hey, a big shout out to my buddy Bob, who also got Wes in touch with me, and uh, want to say thank you for you know opening this door because I've really enjoyed this. It's for me doing the show, you know, because when when Three Sides is done, you know, I'm done doing podcasts. I'm just a dopey fan. I just get lucky that I get to talk to people whose music I dig. So, and you certainly are in that category again. A big part of my musical education is are the plasmatics and you know you were a big part of that co-writing some of my favorite songs by them and you know getting to see you guys live and you know I, again the plasmatics really were groundbreaking and, and you know you made a real you know not to continue things too long but you know the ramones yeah cool and i'm a huge ramones fan but you guys took it to a different level. Plus your record sounded a whole lot better than, you know, the early Ramon stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I, I really think that goes unappreciated because, you know, sex junkie, the way those drums carry out. I mean, that, that, doom, da, 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 doom, da, you know, as a drummer, I was just all over that. <laughs> you know I mean? Just, uh, just fucking great stuff, man. So again, Wes, thank you for, uh, for uh, coming on today. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh thanks for being such a good guy and, and, and uh, anytime you got something else you want to promote just reach out and let us know and we'll we'll send the word out to the kiss army all right sounds good thank you <laughs> thank you so much Wes. Thanks, Wes. uh so tommy mark's got a mission doesn't he now yes he does it's my, it's my life he's got to find out what's going on and you know he will oh yeah <laughs> you know i will what he you does know, that's what i do you know. well that that was like super fucking cool i mean just being a geeky kiss fan like i said that that concert tour was out of the couple hundred shows i've seen from kiss that was still number one again you guys have heard me say it a million times that was the night i said no uh, peter no ace no problem that was right. after that well so, what a nice guy yeah, yeah, almost re reminded me of two things. I don't, I don't mean this in a mean way. When you see it, I'm sure you get it's like riffraff from uh, from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh yeah, kind of got, yeah, I get it. yeah. Well, I, um, you know, I was sitting here going, "This guy was in the Plasmatics. He seems too nice." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I, what a decent, good human being. Great rock and roll stories. And, yep. You know, all that stuff. What a, a good, genuine guy. And and again, you know, I, I've said this about bands like Motorhead and the Ramones and, you know, Plasmatics or certainly like that. You got to be on with your pick. You know, it's funny. He's talking about all downstrokes. You got to, if you, you, that is a discipline, no different than tapping is. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, Johnny Ramone, if, you know, if you don't do that exactly, you don't get that punch. And that's a, that's a skill. You know what I mean? It, you you listen to some of them early plasmatics records. I mean, it's just, it's poetic chaos. If you, if you want, you know what I mean? Uh, Butcher baby is a great example of that, you know? And uh, again, if you, if you're totally unfamiliar, if you're a younger fan, go, go to YouTube and, and pull up uh, master plan. That is, that is just a badass jam, man. That's a good tune. I like that one a lot. And make sure you get the plasmatics version, not the motorhead cover. Cause I think, as a Motorhead fan, I'll say it, and I've said this many times, I've never, never been a huge fan of their covers, like basically any of them. Um, there's a couple standouts, but never really cared for, for Motorhead covers. I just like their originals. Um, but uh, I digress. But anyways, yeah, I mean, great that he, I never knew that, uh, you know, Kiss has always had such a good reputation of treating their opening bands well. You've heard everybody from, yeah, you know, Brian, you know, everybody from Bon Scott to uh, Angus Young and and Bob Seger, and you know, lots of people. Ted Nugent said it on our show. Whenever he opened for Kiss, they treated him real well. And boy, to hear Wes say that they didn't get treated well on. That I know. I, I was like, well, that's so unlike Kiss. But then I also wonder, it, and, you know, and I'm sure nobody will ever admit this. But was Kiss doing that because the Plasmatics were kicking their ass on the tour? Possible. I mean, yeah. or was it just their 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 backhanded getting <coughs> even for getting better reviews than Kiss? 
well, look, not their fault. For shock rock, pure shock rock, it, it was real, especially then. It, it pretty much hard to top what the plasma. Oh no, you hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, you know, looking back now, you're like, oh yeah, Kiss, Pyro, and Tanks, and but you're like. No, that doesn't even come close to what the plasmatics were doing back then. A naked woman in spotty leather with a sometimes wearing a rhino horn and a big leather pentagram behind them. Blowing up cars and TVs and machine guns on stage and smashing TVs, cutting up guitars. Yeah, I'd say that was a little bit more extreme than. Plus, plus you got to remember, Kiss had come out of dynasty unmasked and elder where they visually had already lost their edge yeah they neutered themselves they down. neutered themselves down and now yes they were back with creatures but while they had neutered themselves down to the public the plasmatics were taking what kiss was doing it imagine what kiss did from alice cooper is what the plasmatics did from kiss they took it yeah. to the next level right and, and again, too, don't get, don't, you know, don't get lost musically. There was something there. I mean, again, you two butcher baby. I mean, that's just an aggressive, aggressive pounding riff over and over and over. And, you know, that along with songs like master plan and, uh, you know, check out sex junkie again, that drum, that jungle drums at the beginning are just so cool, but really, and I mentioned it on the show, if the, especially for a young fan or somebody who's unfamiliar Go throw on Pig is a Pig because the first, I'll, I'll ruin it for you, but the first minute's like country and Western. And you're like, what the? And it, you can tell something's coming. I mean, just musically, you're going, what the fuck is this? You know, she's talking about. It, 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 it takes a great band to be able to change their styles so much, so drastically like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, eventually they, 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 you know, they, they just went with an all metal fury. I mean, by the time you get to Maggots, now the Maggots record is also weird because it's got um, a narration between the songs. Yes. Unlike Elder that, that, you know, didn't have a narrator per se, Maggots has, it tells the story as it goes, you know, because, you, you know, let's face it, you really can't always understand what Wendy's saying because she's screaming a lot of times, but, you know, and Maggots is, but actually musically heavy metal wise, that's, that's a pretty cool fucking record. I like it a lot. So. And of course there's the great wow album. The good wow album. Solid. Great wow album. <laughs> If you're a Kiss fan and you have never listened to Wendy O. Williams' Wow, you have to go track it down and listen to it right away. You do. It's 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 worth having. It's got to be in, will... it's got to be in your Kiss library because it's got Gene, Paul, and, and Eric, real quick, real quick, Vinny, really quick, woo, the real quick naked Wendy and the. Uh, I think the I think this is just for the because I think this is from Europe. Uh, this pressing I have has a pretty erotic naked picture of Wendy showing uh, all this her book and her that we were talking about. Also, plenty of yeah. nude photos of or topless photos of her in this. So that's why Tommy so, uh, got it. Tommy's in the middle of a four tissue uh, show. If you notice, he hasn't been on quite yeah. a bit. He's <laughs> mopping up as we speak. <laughs> oh. Wow. Yeah, but there's nothing there's no mention of the ping pong balls <laughs> that's a skill mm. but they, but look at this here's the from milwaukee yes again you yep. know i mentioned that uh, in the show yeah in that book you know it's it doesn't i was I, you know he basically re retold the story um you know uh that I think most plasmatics fans are familiar with. Again, you know, in that book, they have a lot of newspaper articles. It's a cool book. I highly recommend getting it. Uh, if you can find it on eBay, it's not always the easiest book to find, um, but expect to pay a little bit for it. Um, that one has been out of print since the, God, early 80s, I believe. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's it's filled with all kinds of cool uh, band photos and stories and, and covers all that stuff. So yeah, if you get a chance to, to get that, I'd pick it up. I mean, if you're a plasmatics fan, that's a must have. Also the pier is a pier six. What is the pier in New York? There's a really cool uh, 
really cool video. I have it. Um, um, nice. I'm just too lazy to get it and go get it. But, but well, uh, you can get them to go up and look for stuff. I was going to say for 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 homework this week. Are you a Plasmatics fan? Do you? What's your favorite Plasmatics album? Um, yeah. Did, did you, you like see, the metal or punk stuff? I yeah. What punk. what what style of Plasmatics did you like? Did you see Plasmatics on tour with Kiss? And what'd you think of that? It's funny if, if you talk to everybody, who, everybody who says they saw Kiss on a Creatures and I tour, they would have played stadiums. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, amazing how that works out, isn't it? Yeah, funny. I mean, I, I I remember when when I saw the announcement that the Plasmatics, I was like, I knew who they were, and for a while, I'm like, this is a very odd bill putting the Plasmatics on with Kiss because the Plasmatics are not the musical style of Kiss, especially what we were dealing with from True. 79 I thought, on. I think my thought was that they're interesting at least. Oh no, I, 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 yeah, I totally got it. It was, it was cool by me. And it was like, cool. You're stepping out and taking a chance on somebody that is going to put on a visual show just like you are. Um, and in the end, it was it was great. I mean, it was like a heavy metal massacre going on there between Plasmatics and Kiss. I mean, the yeah. you know the arena was blown up at the end of the night. But initially, it was like this is this is ballsy. I mean, this yeah. was this was Kiss not taking the comfortable way out and picking some melodic hard rock they didn't band. axe with them not no knock against axe I'm sure no no you're right you know axe did a few shows molly hatchet did this isn't anything like that this was the plasmatics man right again if you're if you're unfamiliar you know you got to check them out they, they were really something special um there's enough video clips on youtube as oh, yeah. well um, but it, it, again, you know, m very much like the Ramones and I'll go back to one of my favorites monkey suit. Don't, you know, I, I just, that riff over and over and over. And, uh, just, that's just a, such a fun song. I always used to say that song was, was very effective after 2am. <laughs> You're a kid drinking some beers with your buddies, you know, just, uh, and I guess I the, 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 the final homework is if you happen to have the demo of it's my life that Wes is talking about. With yeah. a different guitar solo. Different guitar solo on it. Share it with us. Let Share us it. Let Reach out. Let us know. Or if you know somebody who claims to have it. Mark's going to be it. Because apparently got, got what's three out there now is I, not the Kiss demo. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yep. So I've got three versions on my iPod, so I'm going to go check that out. Yes, I still use an iPod. So. Um, and, uh, oh, God. What was I going to, I was just going to guess, guess next week. No, we, we don't have, I don't think we don't, we don't have any guests lined up, but next week, Tom, first of all, Tommy's gone for two weeks. Who can we yeah. start now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who uh, next week we'll do our recap of the kiss pay-per-view. Oh yeah, that's right. Which, um, you know, by the time you're watching this, it's already happened. But uh, I got to just say, man, I, I, the stage photos are looking phenomenal, especially with all the lights, the logo, the staging. This is going to be a monster show. And Ace Fraley is not going to be there. Oh, please. Which you guys will know stop. by the time you see this. Stop, stop, stop. I mean, Ace actually had to come out and make a statement and say, no, he wasn't asked. Which is ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. It's re goddamn ridiculous, as I like to say. So. Okay. Well, you know, however you want to say it. Exactly. You say um, tomato. Oh, and, 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 and just another quick plug. You got to be following us on all of our social media accounts because Tommy has dug up some amazing photos from the Asylum Tour. Incredible. Incredible. Best. I've got, he, he's given me already like 50 of them to start sharing. And these are, were you like front row? Yeah. Front row, St. Paul, Minnesota, January 21st, 1986. 87 or 86. Yeah. 86. 86. Um, these photos, I kid you not, 
I have not seen better asylum photos. The, the breathing fire shot is amazing. Oh, yeah, the breathing fire shot. Some of the stage photos of the whole logo and its colors. I mean, you know, remember that asylum tour was very colorful. Yeah. And it's you captured been, them all. It was 30 plus years since I had looked at that stuff. And this all happened because of Kyle. Kyle was bugging the crap out of me to find the, the great American music negative so we could transfer everything. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I got creatures and I got asylum and I've got crazy nights and I've got the intrepid and, and the, you know, the dynasty show from Minneapolis. So we'll be sharing a lot of that stuff with you guys. Yeah. Make sure you're following us because you do not want to miss these photos. Trust me as a kiss fan, you haven't seen photos like these from these tours. They are awesome. So um, that's it. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes. And uh, maybe we'll get Lisa to join us next week. Yeah, yeah. You should. And maybe I'll join you. We'll see. It all depends if I can get Wi-Fi. But you're not going to watch the pay-per-view. So what's the point? You're going to talk about the pay-per-view for the whole time? Sure. Well, we're a bunch of geeks, aren't we? Oh, maybe the week after then. <laughs> you realize the next time you guys see us, it's going to be next year. Thank God it'll be 2021. Yeah. Well, this, this, this is 2021 now by the time they see this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank God this 2020 will be behind us. All right. Can we say good night, right. Grace? Let's let's say good night so Mark can go eat. I don't know what is it tonight. Not Chinese. I think, no, I think cereal and for Although I love cereal. 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 What Dude, kind? Like, what kind? Hold on a second. It's like what eight thirty. Oh yeah, this was a late recording too. It's eight thirty at night. Um, I chose I chose to take a tub <laughs> instead of eating dinner when I got home. Just from work. picture that Mark in a hot tub. With, with I'm just finishing the Ted Templeman book. Oh, it's very good. So. Yeah, I, was right. in the, I was in the jacuzzi reading. It was nice. And then I had to hurry up and get out and run down here. Ma making but. his own bubbles. The best guy. <laughs> All right, good night, Gracie. All right. That's it, everybody. We'll see everybody next year. New Year, everyone. <laughs>